My name is James Robson, and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. I'd like to welcome you to the Asia Center's research talk series, which is part of our new series of virtual programs at the Asia Center. The research talks are aimed at showcasing some of the fascinating work being done on various facets of Asia by Harvard students, graduate students, faculty, Asia Center associates, and other specialists. We very much hope you enjoy learning from these presentations. Hi, my name is Chen Shenko. In this video, I'm going to give you a very brief introduction of my book project, Transforming Borneo, from land exploitation to sustainable development. If you ever heard about Borneo, it will probably be about tropical rainforests, amazing wildlife, or exotic culture. In addition, Borneo is also a major timber and palm oil producer. Borneo is the world's third largest island located in Southeast Asia, roughly the size of Texas. At the beginning of the 20th century, the population was only a few million. Today, it has about 24 million inhabitants. Despite the island-wide ecological and cultural continuities, Borneo is politically divided among three countries due to its colonial history. Since the 1970s, the island has undergone tremendous changes. The past five decades of land use changes mark an unprecedented vivid example of land exploitation to jumpstart economic development. As though with vast forests, Large-scale exploitation of timber resources has been deemed a convenient way to jumpstart the economies. This has resulted in severe environmental degradation and greatly altered the landscapes throughout the entire island. Today, the total forested area has decreased to only 48% compared to 76% in the 1970s. In the 1990s, two notable megaprojects were implemented. One was the construction of hydropower dams in the north, built upon the destruction of vast areas of tropical forests. Another one was the Mega Rice project in the south, which aimed to convert peat swamp forests with rich carbon and complex ecological systems into rice fields. The latter has failed miserably and contributed to massive periodic land fires in the past few decades. At the beginning of the 21st century, oil palm has become the new economic paradigm, expanded explosively throughout Borneo. Oil palm is a permanent crop that produces vegetable oils. It is a key income source for Borneo. The expansion of oil palm has exacerbated the fire problem. These land fires reoccur every three to four years causing very serious transboundary haze in the region. Fairly speaking, the land-based development has reduced poverty and increased life expectancy to a substantial extent. But this was achieved at great expense of the environment. Worse still, some communities relying on traditional land-based activities for livelihood were victimized in the wave of development. Today, Borneo is facing a predicament and this book aims to discuss this question. How to maintain economic growth without causing further environmental impacts while repairing the damage done in the past? A broad concept of bioeconomy has caught people's imagination in producing more food and bio-based materials. It illustrates the transition to a bio-based economy by using cutting-edge technologies to optimize the potential of land and biological resources. Meanwhile, a very broad umbrella concept of eco-economy also received close attention. It emphasizes the multifunctionality of land, advocating the needs to observe the biological capacity of the earth system when optimizing the human use of nature. A variety of strategies were formulated, modeled, tested, and implemented to drive economic transformation in different parts of Borneo, albeit in different order of priorities over the environment 
economy and society. First, intensification of cash crop has been deemed a direct measure to reduce unsustainable expansion. Theoretically, the overall yield may be drawn closer to the potential maximum by raising agricultural inputs and improving management. However, these measures are unlikely to have much influence in many places where the agroecological conditions do not permit. Especially for small farmers, boosting productivity with heavy agro inputs also makes little sense in terms of financial risk and resilience in view of the fluctuating commodity prices. Another strategy is diverting future production onto underutilized low carbon land with insignificant ecological services. Proper management of these lands may also help to avoid further land degradation. However, not all these lands are suitable for production. Some are highly degraded and unsuitable for agriculture. Besides, the uncertainty in land ownerships and rights has also been a major issue. Meanwhile, the conservationists argue that it is more important to enhance resilience. A resilient production landscape is able to absorb shocks and stresses like droughts, floods, diseases, etc. And this is critical to protect the economies. This strategy requires redesigning the existing production systems on a landscape scale, considering the complex interactions between ecosystem services and various land uses. A detailed understanding of both direct and indirect economic impacts is imperative in political negotiations, budget allocation, and policy design. Following this direction, a strategy that advocates monetizing nature with economic accounting practices has emerged. In Borneo, this drives the creation of compensation schemes namely RDD Plus to landholders who choose conservation over oil palm cultivation or logging. In a broad sense, the landholders will be paid a certain amount of money for conserving their land based on the amount of carbon stock. Unfortunately, it has been troubled by the intricate challenges of quantifying and monetizing carbon stock as well as fair distribution of payment. Real transformation needs structural changes. This implies reallocation of economic activities across the broad sectors of manufacturing and services. It is expected that countries would pull out of low-cost, unsustainable land exploitation once they diversify away from primary production. As incomes from downstream expand, land-based economies likely enter a transitional period towards a more advanced and possibly more sustainable form of development. With an abundance of primary materials, the island enjoys advantages in vertical expansion to establish downstream activities like oleochemical and advanced biorefining industries. However, to see the expansion of its secondary sector, the island still requires more infrastructure and investment. Alongside this, multiple conservation-related economic opportunities like ecotourism, environmental restoration projects, waste management businesses can be featured. In the long term, how to involve local people in more knowledge-intensive activities and create more high-end jobs for them would be a key to move forward. Following that, the fourth pair of market-based strategies tap on premiums of branding. These two strategies aim to craft differentiated value propositions, tackling consumers that are willing to pay more for sustainability, health, and authentic city, such as RSPO for palm oil, organic labels for health, geographical indicators like Sarawak pepper, etc. The strategies have clear limitations. The premiums will only be harnessed by certain groups who are more capable of delivering these benefits, or else the differentiation will disappear. However, having these strategies in the portfolio can be useful in transition to encourage innovation. Another productivity-based strategy is creating 
new local demand. Local consumption of palm oil and residues for multiple purposes, for example, biofuels and bioenergy, has been encouraged to create a local buffer for sudden price dips. It has happened a few times in history that fresh fruit bunches were left rodent on plantations when prices were too low and, un and unattractive as the farmers have no place to sell their fruits. Meanwhile, the concept of self-sufficiency is also advocated by conservationists as an alternative to productivity-oriented mentality. It prioritizes local food, fiber, fuel, security, and ecosystem services through creating a diversified landscape. It also advocates for the appreciation of the traditional way of living that emphasize human-environmental relationship as farming is treated as an integral part of social life in Borneo. This duo shares a circularity characteristic. While the former has a strong economic objective and the latter focuses on social aspects, convergence is not unlikely in the future when security becomes a more prominent issue than growth. Both can enhance food, fiber, and energy security by optimizing uses of local bioresources, shifting from a linear economy to a complete circular economy, of which products and materials are recycled, recovered, and regenerated. Generally, utility-based development strategies may prevent further degradation but are inadequate to repair the previous environmental damage. Similarly, strategies that emphasize restoration have limited contributions to economic growth. The interconnected nature of economic productivity and conservation means that no single strategy is perfect. Some can be more practical and effective in different stages. This inadequacy demands optimally combining the different strategies to reach both ends with careful consideration of spatial variation and timing of implementation. Trade-offs may need to be made during transition. The subject is still evolving and being explored. It is not simply a series of land cover changes, but also societal evolution with deep implications for future generations. In the near future, digital technologies may be deployed as powerful tools in transforming land-based economies. This will also affect the entire society. There will be new dynamics, new rules, and new thinking. It seems difficult to relate the still largely underdeveloped island with advanced futuristic technologies. However, Two decades ago, likely nobody had imagined that indigenous people dispersed across rural Borneo can be collectively mobilized for businesses, social movement, and interaction with global communities through low-cost smartphones and data connectivity. How Borneo will fare in this sweeping wave of change will be an important question for researchers in the coming years. Thank you for watching this brief introduction of my book project. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please feel free to email me at jinshengo at fas.harvard.edu.